automatically into increasing age. So I'm just trying to be honest. <laughs> if that's possible, but questions if possible from students. All right, anyone? <laughs> Showing my ignorance, but you've been talking about the passive spreading in bridges. Is it still understood that you have trench coal? In other words, that the convection is coal driven from the top, top driven convection? Check those two things separately. The, slight, the, 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 the forces uh, which operate on this thing. On, on plates are, 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 are two. There's, there's ridge push, despite the fact that ridges are compensated, uh, their elevation actually produces a force which pushes away from ridges. And that's, uh, that, that force only arises from the thermal structure above 100, a depth of 100 kilometers. And then the slab pull. The, and, and when those two act together, then the plates move very fast, and that's why the, the big plates <coughs> Slabs attached move faster than, than things like Africa because that's being pushed from every direction. Um, that is a convective, I mean, the slab pull is perfectly mm -hmm. convective force. Right? Um, but the question then is how much of that force, the, 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 the difference in the density, is transmitted around the corner into the horizontal plate? Uh, and that's a, an issue which is still controversial. Uh, there's quite clearly extensive normal faulting uh, on, the, on the oceanic side of, of, of trenches. And some of it <coughs> looks as it goes right through the plate. There's a difficulty in locating the earthquakes, uh, the aftershocks, because for some reason, which I don't think anyone understands, those normal faults tend to have very few aftershocks. Uh, and the main shock is so large, you can't tell <laughs> essentially what depth it's coming from. So we don't really know, I think, how, whether there's an intact flare in the center which is being flexed, or whether those normal faults go right the way through. Uh, my colleagues at Cambridge, particularly uh, the young ones, do not agree with what I've just said. They say it's quite clear it doesn't go through. And that actually the whole of the normal faulting is just simply the flex of the thing on top, but those normal faults are not I, I have a feeling that if you look at the full site and create a paper, that there is, there is a, 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 a pull, but at the bottom of the trenches there is a resistance, and these tend to uh, even, even each other out. They, they parameterize the forces in a particular way, uh, which was quite arbitrary. Right. And in order to get things to balance, they had to do, as you say, they had to put in a resistance force. But, I mean, you don't, you turn to Sydney, you just don't transmit that force around the bank. So that then, well, yeah, yeah. then, then, then there's that problem. Uh, Thank you. I guess you just sort of remind me of something that was relevant to kind of getting the plate tectonics theory coming into, into acceptance, and that's of data. One thing that we don't have good data on, or not excellent data, is the distribution of aftershocks in the oceanic regions. And, and that's a place where we today are still in need of additional ocean bottom seismometer and geodetic observations. And so there's, there are opportunities to further kind of observe and, and let that feed back into the theories. I don't think we have good locations of aftershocks but we have extremely good depth control on earthquakes in oceanic plates. Right? And the, 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 we get that essentially from modeling the waveform of earthquakes, but they need a magnitude above about 5.3, but then you get the depths extremely accurate. And that's the plot I was showing you, the plot I showed. Uh, I am completely with you about the importance of, of, of having ocean bottom instruments. I think that the, I mean, the, the, that's the place to look at the core, right? because you're not trying to look through the continents, but it's expensive. Yeah, I have a question for Chris. Um, when I study early plate tectonics and look at marine magnetic anomalies, especially the anomalies off the west coast of the U.S., 
I'm really surprised at how you can develop such an elaborate theory with sometimes sort of sketchy data, or data that wasn't really exactly, the, well, there were some beautiful profiles in the, in the South Pacific, but some of the other profiles are more difficult, and maybe you can comment. Well, I think Tanya is the person who knows that, more about that than anybody okay. else. But, um, I just wanted to say something I forgot to say uh, about, about the fact that Helen Ray was the only woman scientist on that cruise. And nowadays, this is, this is common, and I think Scripps once had an all-woman scientific <laughs> party. So if you look at the way women have been represented, you know, we've had four or five presidents of AGU who were women, and one of them is now president of the National Academy. So, there has been this huge change. When I first went to the AG meeting, there were no women there. Now, there were a lot. If you look at our students, you know, there's a tremendous number of them are women. So it's changed. Good. I've asked you about that. Graduate student. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Dan. In your model, did you consider the mid Cretaceous volcanic event is becoming more and more uh, evident? That there's a mid Cretaceous volcanic event. You can see it on the Java, Narrow Basin, Mid Pacific, Kerguelen. We see those morphological features, but it, there could be also, because it's a big global event, there could be uh, seals and intrusions underneath during or right around 120 million years. So it's young in like the Watts model. So uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's your concern, therefore, that, that, that our depths are in error? Or, 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 or is your concern that, that we need to account for, the, for, for, the, for, for a, a global volcanic event? I'm concerned about the, temp uh, the, te uh, the temperature as well as the that because if you have a big volcanic event around 120 million years, 125 million years, it will screw, screw up your temperature as well as your bathymetry. I think that the, I mean, the time constant of the oceanic lithosphere is 60 million years, so any perturbation of the temperature in the Cretaceous would by now decay. But I don't think that's a problem. I think the problem, I mean, the, 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 the question as to whether it's global or not, I don't have strong views on. The, the, the thing which I, I think we don't really uh, take proper account of is that if you produce a lot, if you, if you start a new plume underneath uh, a, 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 a plate and generate very large amounts of volcanism, uh, that melt will flow enormous distances, even though it's underwater. Right? And, and that clearly has happened in, in, in the Pacific. And we don't really, I think, have a very good understanding of what processes involved are when that happens. Right? But the, the, I mean, what I know is the transparent layer in the Pacific. Right? I mean, don't, don't think that has much effect on, 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 on depth age. And in any case, we're correct with that when, when, we, when we take it out. So I don't think it mucks up the depth age. I think the, the events that produce uh, large volcanic uh, events, the, the large igneous provinces, I think the, the difficulty there is can't, that we, we can't actually see it happening now. And you know, a great deal of the assances, uh, the, the things that, you, that, that we see happening now, like for instance glaciations, uh, we say, oh yes, yes, we know the glaciation clearly happened, but you know, here's a glaciation. But a lot of these events are so bizarre that if you actually, I mean, plate tectonics itself, I mean, if somebody told you, right, with no observations, that that was how one of these systems behaved, people would say, you know, don't be silly. You can't possibly have a can whose elastic thickness is, is, is only like 30 or 40 kilometers which extends 10,000 kilometers and behaves as a rigid cap. That's nonsense. <laughs> well, no, it isn't nonsense, because we see it happen. And we must be led by the observations. The problem with the, the large igneous uh, 
But I would say this is that, that we actually can't see what's happening now. And that makes, I think, it rather difficult to, to, to understand exactly how it works. And in particular, about the transport of, of material between the upper and lower mantle, which I think is, is a really major question still. Uh, I know that most, people, most seismologists believe that the plume started at the core mantle boundary. And most geochemists believe that they started at 670. Right? I myself um, have, think that both views are correct, uh, but uh, that there is some transport across it. And the, the, uh, and, and the geochemical observations actually require transport across 670, but only about a quarter of the subduction to the material needs to go through to balance the geochemistry. But I think we've got to have transport between the two. Um, well, thank you. Um, I have a question about how you felt. This is something Richard Hay asked at AGU. When you went to the post office and the Bob and getting those stamps, that what this paper, the impact this paper might have in the future. I thought we'd both get elected to the Royal Society. Because <laughs> <laughs> I put it through the <laughs> <laughs> And I, I was, 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 was just voting that. I was mean, 35 and I thought, right, that's it. <laughs> what what did completely astonished me was how quickly uh, everybody involved in that became so well known. And, you know, within a year I was invited to, to lots of international conferences as pairs pay everything as one of the, the, the invited speakers. And that was good, quite extraordinary to go from, from being, you know, a, a first year postdoc completely unknown to being some, somebody who, you know, everybody automatically said, come. Yeah. That was the most amazing event. Right. Chris but I think it, 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 I mean, you know, I hope it didn't go to my head. <laughs> uh, Chris pointed out, unfortunately, I am raising my head, so. Yeah, this is a question for now. So I may have missed some of the logic, but you showed uh, Zeewolith data from Kibberlites to, to show your seismic profile. Can you just comment on the validity of those, given that these Kibberlites, I'm sitting here with my petrology class, by the way. So what is the possibility of using Kibberlite Zeewolith that have seen melt at a sometimes of a re-fertilization for, for these uh, profiles that you showed? The, the, the reason why I use them is because from the oceans I don't have any control on uh, temperatures, uh, pressures, above, uh, uh, pressure, uh, 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 depths greater than 100 kilometers. And from the Kimberlock modules I can get estimates of, of pressure and temperature from the petrology down to be, between 100 and 200 kilometers. And I also have, since our, 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 our tomography is global, I have velocities at those depths from, from the surface of tomography. I'm quite careful about what I use to, 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 to determine the, 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 I mean the, 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 the pressures and temperatures. And the, the, I use uh, Nimitz and Grutter and Taylor. Right? Nimitz and Grutter for the, for, 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 for the temperature, Taylor for the pressure. Uh, Ray, uh, uh, and, and Kohler is almost equally good. Both of those are essentially based on laboratory experiments uh, and they use the intersolubility of OPX and CPX to get the temperature and the, 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 the aluminium content of the, the, the OPX in the presence of garnet to get the pressure. And the reason why I stick with uh, and, and so I'm using aluminium, calcium, uh, 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 aluminium, calcium, major elements. And those are not, uh, uh, the, 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 I don't think there's a major change in the interior of those grains from the metasomatic enrichment. Um, I think that's okay. Um, the, uh, and and I, uh, I, I restricted it to, to nodules which uh, Hermann and Goethe had essentially uh, decided were, were reliable. And I actually take the, 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 uh, the surface wave tomography, take the location of the Kimberlite pipe, and then 
project the velocity, get the, the, extract the velocity from that model at the actual depth of that particular model. So I, I go as far back as I can rather than taking, you know, essentially geotherms. I just take the actual model. Uh, the, 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 the reduction in, in the variance is by a, about a factor of three. Uh, so I think that, that, that that's actually quite wrong. Have I answered your question? Well, I certainly have a question from a student. Good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, good day. Um, so just wondering from your theory uh, modeling, um, what kind of your thoughts on the nature of the sensitive uh, boundary and the oceans? And uh, maybe comment on any geophysical methods you might think might be useful for understanding that boundary? I, I mean, it, I, I use lithosphere uh, as a very sort of loose and, and, and yeah, and, uh, notion because everybody has defined the lithosphere in a different way. Uh, what I've been talking about here, uh, it, uh, I mean, if I want to be more precise, I talk about mechanical and thermal boundary. Right, the mechanical boundary being the part of the lithosphere which is rigidly bolted to the top, right, to the magnetic on this. The thermal boundary layer being the convective, uh, the, the, the boundary layer of the convective circulation which extends uh, uh, below that. To get a lithosphere out of that notion, what I do is I take the conductive uh, geothermal down until I reach the potential temperature of the interior. And so my lithosphere actually comes slap in the middle of the convective, of, of, of the, 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 the thermal boundary layer which is involved in convection. So it has absolutely nothing to do with any rigid notion, right? Because the bottom of the plate, you've got to keep them warm, right? So you actually have to bring up hot material and take the cold material away. The question of exactly how that happens and what the circulation looks like, and particularly its plan form, we simply don't know, at least I don't. Um, but, so, I, I, mean, you know, I don't think there is such a thing as the lithosphere of sea to boundary, largely because I don't think the lithosphere is, is a notion that you can define properly. At least, you, know, you can use whatever definition you like. And I think it's a convective circulation of things. Uh, okay, we need to close fairly soon, but go ahead. Well, you had your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dan, I couldn't agree with you more about the upwelling sheet. I've been fighting with it all my life. And it's, you, all, you just can't understand the Pacific at all if you've got, you know, some ridges fastened to something in the deep mantle. And also, it makes a big mess when you try to subduct it, a spread and center, which happens all the time, all, all over the place. So really, my question is to everybody in the room, what are we going to do about this? Because every single beginning geology book has a picture with an upwelling under a spreading center. And they, it's really the analogy of the boiling pot. And when you look at a boiling pot, so just don't look at the downwelling part. <laughs> what you see is the upwelling. So every, every one of those books has a picture of a boiling pot and the upwelling pushing the plates apart. So it, it, I think it's a, um, a job for all of us to think of some analogy that ordinary people have experienced in their lives that has this, would get the idea of passive, passive plate movements. I think the problem's even worse than <coughs> you've done it because there, there are places like Iceland where the upwelling actually gets trapped on the divergence. Right, and that really confuses everything. And <laughs> gradually drifts there, the, 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 the upwelling, gradually drifts with respect to the, 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 the plate boundary. And when it's drifted too far, it, the ridge jumps back onto the, 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 onto the plume. So there's a whole series of jumps as it goes back. And, and so you have a big transform fault on the north west, and another one on the south in order that the spreading should stay on top of the plume. And that is going to, I mean, you know, how do you actually, given that, to, 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 to persuade people that, that the notions are wrong? 
This idea is clearly born out of it, if we hadn't already got there. The GPS would have done it for us just like that, you know, mm. there's no denying it. Mm. Right? Um, and, you know, you, so people ask me this question, and I cannot put them in the state of mind that we were in 50 years ago. I'd just like to make a comment. <coughs> The president of the Geological Society of America was giving his presidential talk during what all this was happening. It was a huge earthquake. Uh, and, and after it, he was asked, does this earthquake change your mind about how to fix the continent? So he said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Is that last one? No, I don't know about that. The others, though, I restrict us to historical questions, not current technical issues. Okay. I have one question I've always wanted to put the press with Okay, I was a roommate of Fred Vaughn. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I know how to find a back and see what it was when we actually published it. But the question is, there's, there's a paper that came before that, where it was what, the one Gurdjieff and Peters, the 
terms of getting anomalies over the, uh, the Gulf of in uh, the Red Sea. The Red Sea. You remember, how, why did that have as much effect as uh, on, on the early stuff as did as did the Lions did? I don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Not into the new part of the Middle Ocean Ridges. I don't know. Oh, because they couldn't move, they didn't have any idea how to get the material up. Is that the. I don't know. So, I, I heard the story that might answer this question, and I think I heard it from well, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, the study in the Gulf of Aden, I believe, came up with, they were studying uh, magnetic anomalies over a seamount, and one appeared to be reversed. And at Cambridge, they were having a, a cookie and coffee hour, and Vine and Matthews and Bullock were sitting around talking about the strange results. And Bullard said, well, what if the seafloor is moving and the all cats are coming up and getting reversed, and the field is reversing at the same time. This would, ex this would explain it. That's true. Yeah. I think one of you guys told me that story. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I do know this, that, that on that rice pack cruise that I was a slave on, <laughs> there, there were two people who might have known about magnetic anomalies. One was Say Uyeda and one was Art Rath. And during the conversation, I can't remember who said it, Somebody said well, maybe it's reversals of the field which cause these magnetic anomalies, what they are. But I cannot remember whether it was, say, a Vieira or Art Rath. But you know, that's, that makes sense because every so once, once in a while in science, when it becomes clear what the answer is, a lot of people have the answer at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I have a word in edge ways on that, which is that, that actually, uh, the, the, I think a very key feature of, 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 of my Matthews paper was that John Matthews had carried out a survey in the Indian Ocean, and it was on the Carlsberg Bridge, not, not, not in the Gulf of Aden, of various seamounts, and they were very close to the equator, the, the magnetic equator. And c carrying out a survey in those days was really difficult because they had to moor boys right, in in, in water depths of, of, of you know, three or four kilometers with piano wire right, uh, to, to, to do the radar to get, because we hadn't got GPS. Uh, so he did a very careful survey of the seamount there, which was quite clearly reversed the magnetized because it was on the magnetic equator. There were many such seamounts in the, 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 the Mason Lake survey. But the problem there was that the bathymetry was classified. So the only person who saw the bathymetry of all the people we've been talking about was actually Harry Hess, because he was an admiral of the Navy, and he knew there was a ridge there. Right? And he and Tuzo were sharing a room at, 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 at the, in Cambridge at, at, on sabbatical. Uh, and Tuzo was very bothered by the fact that the, there was an offset between the San Andreas Fault and the Queen Charlotte Islands Fault where there should be a ridge there. And Harry said, yes, of course there's a ridge there. <laughs> and then Fred went up to the library and got out the, the, the Mason Ath survey. And that was the first time anyone recognized the, the, the symmetry about the spreading axis. And, and that was purely because Harry was, 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 was there and knew about the spreading ridge. <laughs> I will partly, this is to Dave Sandwell's question, and I cannot resist closing with a story, uh, which includes the first here, uh, which is about the magnetics from the Dick Vakia collected. And I have this from Bill Menard's book that Vic gave a seminar at Swims. And someone in the audience said, well, you know, have you looked at this statistically? Have you done a time series analysis of this and looked for coherence? And Vakia said, no, I haven't done that. He went to a statistician, showed him the data, and the statistician said, you don't need to do that, it's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> of course they match. <laughs> so, I'm not
not sure I won't actually want to give my students that. <laughs> <laughs> they are now. Let's thank our speaker.